Welcome to our video on Peter Shinesky's poetry. Selected poems from the anthology Immigrant Chronicle are set texts for belonging for some advanced, standard and ESL students. So when you come to your set text, you have to know all of your poems really well. You can't just focus on the one or two that you sort of like, because the Board of Studies may actually pick the poems for you. So it's really best if you know your poems so well that you can almost recite parts of them by heart. The also, the best way to approach poetry is to look at who wrote the poetry as your starting point. So let's start now by looking at Peter Shinesky. So Peter Shinesky was born in 1945 and has Polish and a Ukrainian background. So his father's Polish and his mother's Ukrainian. His family migrated to Australia after World War II. After a long sea journey, they were placed in Park's Migrant Centre, which by all accounts was not a very pleasant place to live. In 1951, they moved to a working class suburb near Strathfield, which is the basis of the poem, 10 Mary Street. As an adult, he began writing poetry and studying English, and he went on to become a primary school teacher. From there, he's now become the senior lecturer at the University of Western Sydney, and is considered Australia's authority on the experiences of Polish migrants. So what happened to Poland? In World War II, Poland was occupied by the Nazis and they had a huge resistance movement against them. Poland lost the highest percentage of citizens of any country in the war. So they fought very, very hard to defend their homeland and it was quite difficult to organize these underground movements and so a lot of people risked and lost their lives in order to defend their country. Many of the people who'd fought so hard for their country were displaced when the boundaries were redrawn at the war's end. So that actually made Poland officially 20% smaller. So if you think about that, one in five Polish people had to leave. Many Polish migrants had experienced forced labour camps, hunger, and the post-war domination of their country by Russia, which was heartbreaking for many. Migrants who settled in Australia were kept in quite primitive conditions and felt quite isolated due to racism and the prejudice of the 1950s WASP Australia. So you might hear the term WASP bandied about a bit. What it means is white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, and it refers to the kind of migrant that Australia liked, which was white and came from probably England rather than from the sort of more European nations. So that's the kind of experience that made Peter Shinesky and his family. So let's have a look at some of the common belonging themes in Peter Shinesky's work. First of all is isolation. So Peter and also his family, possibly in greater Australia. Migrant experiences, prejudice, family relationships, so he's written poems for both his mother and his father there, sense of place, language and communication, and of course the major theme for Peter Shinesky is the idea that one needs to search for their own sense of belonging rather than inheriting it from their family or their nation. So Peter can't be Polish exactly like his parents and he can't be Australian exactly like the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. He has to find his own sen sense of belonging which comes from somewhere between the two cultures. So now we're going to spend some time looking at each of the poems individually. I'm going to read through these poems and then we'll go on to look at some of the techniques and themes used. So the first one is postcard. A postcard sent by a friend haunts me since its arrival. Warsaw, panorama of the old town. He requests I show it to my parents. Red buses on a bridge emerging from a corner High-rise flats and something like a park borders the river with its concrete pylons. The sky is the brightest shade. Warsaw, old town, I never knew you except in the third person. Great city that bombs destroyed, its people massacred or exiled. You survived in the minds of a dying generation, half a world away. They shelter you and defend the patterns of your remaking, condemn your politics, cherish your old religion, and drink to freedom under the White Eagle's flag. For the moment, I repeat, I never knew you. Let me be. I've seen red buses elsewhere, and all rivers have that obstinate glare. My father will be proud of your domes and towers. My mother will speak of her beloved Ukraine. What's my choice to be? I can give you the recognition of eyesight and praise. What more do you want besides the gift of despair? 
I stare at the photograph and refuse to answer the voices of red gables and a cloudless sky. On the river's bank, a lonely tree whispers, we will meet before you die. So let's analyze that now. This is Chinesky's emotional response to a postcard which depicts the capital city of Poland, which is Warsaw. While Chinesky feels quite second-hand fondness for Warsaw and his Polish heritage as a whole, he doesn't feel that his fondness is genuine because he's never been to Poland himself, so that's why he refers to it in the third person. He does, however, feel drawn to journey to Poland and someday um, visit it because it represents a part of his identity, which he cannot escape. So that's when the poem ends with, we will meet before you die. It's almost like he can't help it, it's fated, unavoidable. Let's have a look at some of these techniques. So the main two themes you'd identify in this poem would be identity and sense of place. Chinesky conveys impersonal tone in the first section of the postcard by using third person. So he's describing it as though there's no intimacy there. That's contrasted with the second section of the poem, where he personifies the town as an old friend. It suggests an intimacy with Warsaw that the poet doesn't really have yet. The persona's dilemma comes with the rhetorical question, what's my choice to be? And what more do you want besides the gift of despair? Despair occurs in this poem because the persona's di of the persona's dilemma about where he belongs. So you can see that he's got a gravitational pull towards the culture of his family and his parents who lovingly describe their hometown, but he can't feel it really for himself yet, but he knows it's something that he's going to have to investigate in his search for belonging and identity. All right, let's look at the poem Migrant Hostel. Mm -hmm. Migrant Hostel, Parks, 1949 to 1951. No one kept count of all the comings and goings, arrivals of newcomers in busloads from the station, sudden departures from adjoining blocks that left us wondering who would be coming next. Nationalities sought each other out instinctively, like a homing pigeon circling to get its bearings. Years and place names recognised by accents, partitioned off at night by memories of hunger and hate. For over two years we lived like birds of passage, always sensing a change in the weather, unaware of the season whose track we would follow. A barrier at the main gate sealed off the highway from our doorstep. As it rose and fell like a finger, pointed in reprimand or shame, and daily we passed underneath or alongside it, needing its sanction to pass in and out of lives that had only begun or were dying. So the tone of that poem is obviously quite serious and quite sombre. Let's have a look at some of the more in-depth ideas. And that's the picture of the actual uh, hostel right there. This poem is about how difficult it is to create a sense of belonging or stability when you're physically moving around from place to place. So their lives have only just begun or were dying and they keep getting shuffled around and they can't get any sense of permanence. And that's a big problem for belonging in the poem. It's also about the lowly status of migrants who are herded about like cattle with very little thought to their emotional well-being from either the government or society as a whole. So that's where we get all of the bird imagery from. The themes that we'd be looking at would be barriers to belonging and migrant experiences. Animal imagery shows the migrant's lowly place in society. So the use of homing pigeons is ironic because these people have no home to return to. They can't go back to Poland. Birds of passage, which is supposed to be like geese that fly south for the winter, are dependent on the changes of the fickle weather, which is a recurring motif for powerlessness in the face of irrational change. So when they say they don't know whose season they're going to follow, this is the problem that they're experiencing. Like a homing pigeon is a forceful simage, uh, simile, which suggests the natural instincts of birds to gravitate towards what is familiar. So that's when they say in the poem, nationality sought each other out. They had familiar accents and things like that that they were looking for. So the migrants gravitate towards the accents of people that speak their language. However, 
the anonymity or the lack of identity in the poem is suggested in the very opening, no one kept count of all the comings and goings. So there's still a sense that um, identity is being questioned here, or that one can't form a strong identity when they're not allowed to sort of put down roots and make a sense of place. Barriers to belonging are symbolised by the final section of the poem, where they describe the gate barrier, which is a physical inan inanimate object to which the migrants are beholden. So they say that, oh, Shinesky says that they needed its sanction in order to move from one place to the other. It's described as a finger that pointed in reprimand or shame, where both the nouns reprimand and shame have negative connotations. The migrants are also partitioned off from one another at night. So they may be, you know, drawn to each other during the day um, by this language and this connection that they feel, but at night the alliterative memories of hunger and hate mean that they feel that they can't really connect to one another either. So now we're going to look at Felix Shinesky. My gentle father kept pace only with the Joneses of his own mind's making, loved his garden like an only child, spent years walking its perimeter from sunrise to sleep, alert, brisk and silent, he swept its paths ten times around the world. Hands darkened from cement, fingers with cracks like the sods he broke. I often wondered how he existed on five or six hours sleep a night, why his arms didn't fall off from the soil he turned and tobacco he rolled. His Polish friends always shook hands too violently, I thought. Felix Szyneski, that formal address I never got used to. Talking, they reminisced about farms where paddocks flowered with corn and wheat, horses they bred, pigs they were skilled in slaughtering. Five years of forced labour in Germany did not dull the softness of his blue eyes. I never once heard him complain of work, the weather, or pain. When twice they dug cancer out of his foot, his comment was, but I'm alive. Growing older, I remember words he taught me, remnants of a language I inherited unknowingly, the curse that damned a crew-cut, grey-haired department clerk, who asked me in dancing bear grunts, did your father ever attempt to learn English? On the back steps of his house, bordered by golden cypress, lawns, geraniums younger than both parents, my father sits out the evening with his dog, smoking, watching stars and streetlights come on, happy as I have never been. At thirteen, stumbling over tenses in Caesar's Gallic War, I forgot my first Polish word. He repeated it, so I never forgot. After that, like a dumb prophet, watched me pegging my tents further and further south of Hadrian's Wall. All right, so let's analyze that. Felix Szyneski is a tribute poem, which is for the composer's father. So the poem shows us that Felix was an independent man who was a survivor. So we see that when he says, but I'm alive. So he's experienced an awful lot of hardship and has always had a positive attitude about overcoming it. He created his own world rather than trying to compete in the world of other people. So that's shown to us in the line, uh, keeping up with the Joneses of his own mind's making. Felix knows that his son is growing up differently, moving away from his culture, but he is also wise enough to know that he can't really do anything about it. He can't prevent his son from becoming assimilated into Australian culture and the English language. So that's shown in a lot of the historical allusions that are made in the final stanza of the poem. So let's have a look at some of the techniques. The major themes here are obviously the relationship that Felix has with his son and cultural identity. The pronoun of ownership, my, and the diction gentle and softness of his blue eyes shows that Peter's affectionate towards his father, so he has a very fond loving feeling for his father. There is a blend of childlike and adult perspective in the poem. The childlike register of language is shown in ten times around the world and why his arms didn't fall off. Historical allusions such as watched me pegging my tents further and further south of Hadrian's Wall make the event of Peter losing his Polish culture seem sort of fated or unavoidable. 
Historical battles, such as Caesar's Gallic Wars, symbolize the war between the two cultures, particularly Peter's loss of the Polish language. So he focuses a lot on language in his poems, so he talks about losing his first word and things like that. So let's look now at the poem Ten Mary Street. For nineteen years we departed each morning, shut the house like a well-oiled lock, hid the key under a rusty bucket, to school and work, over that still too narrow bridge, around the factory that was always burning down. Back at 5pm from the polite humdrum of washing clothes and laying sewerage pipes, my parents watered plants, grew potatoes and rows of sweet corn, tended roses and camellias like adopted children. Home from school earlier, I'd ravage the backyard garden like a hungry bird, until, bursting at the seams of my little blue St. Patrick's College cap, I'd swear to stay off strawberries and peas forever. The house stands in its china blue coat, with paint guaranteed for another ten years. Lawn grows across dug-up beds of spinach, carrots and tomato. The whole block had been gazetted for industry. For 19 years we lived together, kept pre-war Europe alive with photographs and letters, heated discussions and embracing gestures, visitors that ate kielbasa, salt herrings and rye bread, drank raw vodka or cherry brandy, and smoked like a dozen puffing billies. Naturalised more than a decade ago, we became citizens of the soil that was feeding us, inheritors of a key that'll open no house when this one is pulled down. So the tone of that poem is probably a lot more positive and upbeat than a lot of the other Shinesky poems. Let's have a look at that one. So 10 Mary Street is the Shinesky's first house in Australia and becomes Peter's childhood home. It represents a kind of bubble in which their Polish culture can be experienced, safe and enclosed from the world outside. The poem is also about Peter slowly coming to terms with his split cultural identity as he grows up. <coughs> The themes of sense of place and cultural identity are very strong in this poem. So mostly it's a positive sense of place, which is not something that features much in other senses of um, Peter Shinesky's work. The plant motifs connote the wholesome domestic lifestyle of Peter's childhood. So that shows him gutsing on the peas and the strawberries. The house is nurturing him in a way that a lot of other environments haven't done. The symbolism of the key represents life's changes. So the key opens a door. So inheritors of a key that'll open no house when this one's pulled down. So a door usually represents a change, and so this is sort of symbolic for the changes that are a part of life and growing up. Forceful sim similes such as like adopted children indicate that there still is a sense of dislocation from Australia and not only the society but also the landscape. So the children aren't natural, they're adopted. And there's also a bit of a sense in the too narrow bridge that there's not really a good sense of connection between this house and the outside world. The personification of the house's china blue coat connotes Peter's sense of protection from Australian culture at home. <clears throat> so the coat represents um, sort of protective safe feelings that are associated with the house. Let's look at the poem St Patrick's College now. <clears throat> Impressed by the uniforms of her employer's sons, mother enrolled me at St Pat's, with never a thought to th fees and expenses, wanting only what was best. From the roof of the secondary school block, Our Lady watched with outstretched arms, her face overshadowed by clouds. Mother crossed herself as she left me at the office, said a prayer for my future intentions. Under the principal's window, I stuck pine needles into the motto of my breast, Luciet Lux Vestra, I thought was a brand of soap. For eight years I walked Strathfield's paths and streets, played chasings up and down the station's ten ramps, caught the 414 bus like a foreign tourist, uncertain of my destination every time I got off. For eight years I carried the blue, black and gold I'd been privileged to wear, learned my conjugations and Christian decorums for homework, was never too bright at science, but good at spelling, could say the Lord's Prayer in Latin all in one breath. My last day there, Mass was offered up for our departing intentions, 
Our Lady still watching above, unchanged by eight years weather. With closed eyes, I fervently counted the 78 pages of my Venite Adoremus, saw equations I never understood rubbed off the blackboard, voices at bus stops, litanies and hymns, taking the right-hand turn out of Edgar Street for good, prayed that Mother would someday be pleased with what she'd got for her money. The darkness around me wasn't for the best before I let my light shine. So again, this is a more upbeat poem in the way. There's a little bit of humour used in this, which gives it a lighter tone. But overall, we get the sense that he's not terribly happy with his time at St. Patrick's College. So it's about his time at school, which is a little bit oppressive because he can't relate to the culture of his fellow students. There is a dislocation because he has to travel to school and participate in a religious culture that he doesn't really understand, as well as associating with children from a different social class. So you can tell that because the poem opens with um, my mother's employer's children went to this school. So that gives you a sense that there's a little bit of maybe um, uh, wealth or class differentiation between the students and there's a religious culture going on that he simply doesn't understand. So the themes are cultural displacement and lack of understanding. The public transport motifs represent a sense of dislocation. So you've got the 414 bus and the sense that he feels like a foreign tourist, uncertain of his destination. And again, he mentions the voices of bus stops. So if you think about a bus as a symbol, it's a big and personal vehicle which transports lots of people, not just you. So it's about not feeling as though you're really having any control over the direction you're going. Religious allusions are used to show Peter's lack of identification with the religious culture of his school. And so he keeps using the pronoun Our Lady. So Our Lady is a reference to the Virgin Mary, but when he uses Our, it's ironic because he doesn't really feel any association with the Virgin Mary at all. Humour and low register are used to kind of mock the serious establishment of the school. Luciat Lux Vestra, I thought was a brand of soap. So Luciat Lux Vestra is Latin for let your light shine, but in the old days there used to be a brand of Australian soap called Lux, which is what the joke hinges on. He also uses the phrase out of Edgar Street for good rather than using proper grammar. So we know that he's trying to create a kind of lighthearted tone. A lack of connection is evident in the Synodosh where his fellow students are reduce, reduced to voices at bus stops. So that shows he hasn't got really any personal sense of connection to any of his fellow students. So let's look at the poem Ancestors now. Who are these shadows that hang over you in a dream, the bearded, faceless men standing shoulder to shoulder? What secrets do they whisper into the darkness? Why do their eyes never close? Where do they point to from the circle around you? To what star do their footprints lead? Behind them are mountains, the sound of a river, a moonlit plain of grasses and sand. Why do they never speak? How long is their wait to be? Why do you wake as their faces become clearer, your tongue dry as caked mud? From across the plain where sand and grasses never stir, the wind tastes of blood. So let's have a look at that. So this is not really a narrative poem, like most of the other so um, poems that Chinesky recounts tell a story. This one is more just a consideration of an idea. So Chinesky is reflecting on the nature of heritage and the sort of um, concealed men who make up our pasts all the way back down our lineage, which are kind of part of ourselves as well. At the time the poem's composed, it's kind of making it sound as though it's responding to a dream that Chinesky had, and maybe to a dream that we all have, a sort of sense of a foggy understanding of where we all come from and what our past truly is. So the themes are heritage, lack of understanding, and communication. The use of rhetorical questions shows his confusion. So who are these shadows standing shoulder to shoulder? He uses quite a lot of rhetorical questions throughout the poem, and in every stanza there's sort of a, a tone of questioning or not understanding. A lack of understanding about one's heritage is connoted in the diction shadows, faceless, secret, and whisper. The poem has quite repetitive stanza shapes, which suggest repetition or cohesion down the ancestral line. So this isn't something that Chinesky often does. This shape is quite deliberate. 
And so he's giving us a sense that there's a repetitive pattern, you know, stretching on into the past or stretching on into the future. A lack of communication with his past is symbolised by tongue dry as caked mud. So that implies that he can't speak to his past or that his past can't speak to him. But also it connotes the idea of trying to speak from beyond the grave. So that's why the mud imagery. The use of second person, so a lot of the language is phrased as you, like directed to the audience. And relatable deep images like moonlight and sand suggest that the persona's struggle to understand the past is also shared by the reader. So he's trying to make this not just about his own experience, but about an experience that we might all relate to. So let's look at the final poem now in the Folk Museum. A darkness in the rooms betrays the absence of voices. Departing from the steps and veranda rails, onto a street that leads around autumn, which stands at the door, dressed in yellow and brown. I look at words that describe machinery, clothes, transport, a Victorian bedroom, hay knife, draining plough, shoulder yoke, box iron, relics from a tableland's heritage to remind me of a past which isn't mine. The caretaker sits beside a winnowing machine and knits without looking up. Her hair's the same colour as the grey clay bottle that's cold as water to touch. In the town hall next door, they sing to Christ of the Sabbath day and the future of man. I try to memorise the titles of books, while Eternity, Eternity is repeated from a reader's text. The wind taps hurriedly on the roof and walls. I leave without wanting a final look. As the door, at the door, the old woman's hand touches mine. Would you please sign the visitor's book? So that poem ends with a little bit of irony because, of course, Shinesky isn't a visitor, he's an Australian citizen. Shinesky visits a museum which holds relics of farming and outback life in Australia. He feels disconnected from the items in the museum and from the people of the township, including the caretaker of the museum, and decides that he doesn't feel welcome. Because of his Polish ancestry, she takes him for a foreign tourist instead of an Australian citizen and asks for him to sign the visitor's book. So the themes here are barriers to belonging and cultural identity. The motif of labels, words that describe machines, and the accumulation of things like box iron, winnowing machine, all that kind of stuff, represent the way we categorise objects and people. So we do like to label things. The use of space also makes the reader feel boxed in because it's the music from next door pressing in on the scene. They sing to Christ. And they use further religious allusions that show that the only voices represented in the town are Christian, or that white Anglo-Saxon Protestant voice that we were talking about earlier. Disconnection is symbolised in the caretaker six sits without looking up, so it shows that she's almost disinterested in Peter. And in the simile, cold as water to touch, so he's describing her as a cold and distant person. Pathetic fallacy represents Shinesky's emotional response, the wind taps hurriedly on the roof. So pathetic fallacy is when we put our emotions onto nature and we say that the nature has them. So in this case, it's not really the wind that's tapping hurriedly wanting him to leave, it's Peter who wants to leave, and he's describing the wind that way in order to express that. So those are the poems that you study. We're going to have a look at a couple of further resources for Shinesky you can find online. There's always good things to look at. So HSC Online covers Shinesky quite well. Um, and you can also look at an interview with Peter Shinesky and an analysis of his poetry at this website. And Peter Shinesky also has an official website where he tries to upload any information that he thinks might be helpful to schools in order to study the subject. So that's the end of this lesson. Mm -hmm.